Tim, do you want to switch off your camera for a moment? And yeah. We get it on. I've got it on yet. Hello and welcome again. We may have had some technical problems, but try. But welcome to the second Manchester Mask Seminar. I'm Peter Trainer, the Clinical Director of the Manchester Academic Health Science Centre. And just to start off, I'd like to go through the house rules for those participating by Zoom. Please mute your microphones and switch off your cameras. We're going to take questions at the end of the two presentations. So please feed your questions through via the chat facility on Zoom, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can ask questions via email to maskseminars at healthinnovationmanchester.com. That's maskseminars at healthinnovationmanchester.com. We'll take all the questions at the end. As I mentioned, this is the second in our series of mask seminars, and we were delighted with the response to the first. We, we rapidly sold out the 300 invitations to Zoom and approximately an additional 700 people have viewed the presentation through the Health Innovation Manchester YouTube channel. And for those that want to learn more about the lung immune response to COVID and see Tracy Hussle and her colleagues' excellent presentation, it's still available to view on the Health Innovation Manchester website and its YouTube channel. The next seminar in two weeks time will again be on, focused on COVID and will be Thomas House from the Department of Mathematics at the University discussing the modeling of pandemics and obviously C19 as the focus and Aparna Varma from epidemiology will be looking at the epidemiology of the pandemics. And I think that will be an excellent seminar in, in two weeks time. We'll then take a summer break and come back in the autumn and hopefully by then we'll be able to think about things other than COVID and I would invite you to send your suggestion of speakers or any other feedback you've had on the seminar series to mask seminars at healthinnovationmanchester.com and we'll come back with a series highlighting some of the great clinical academic work that's occurring in the Manchester area. Today, the focus is going to be on the current and future diagnostic and therapeutic strategies around COVID. And we're going to have two great speakers drawn from the stellar pool of Manchester clinical academics. First up is going to be Professor Rick Bodie, who is the Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Manchester, and since 2012, a consultant in emergency medicine at Manchester Royal Infirmary. He's also the director of the Manchester Diagnostic Technology Accelerator. And his interests are about decision making, the use of um, assays and technology in assistant decision making and early diagnosis. And therefore, it was a very 
intuitive challenge to him to address the flow of patients with, with COVID-related symptoms that are arriving in A&E at the Royal Infirmary. And as well as he's going to share with us his experience of the management and the diagnostic challenges and what we can expect to see in, in the future improvements of diagnosis. And when he's finished, he will hand over to Tim Felton, Felton who is a senior lecturer within the university and a consultant in intensive care at Withenshaw Hospital. Tim's a Nottingham graduate who was tempted to Manchester via Sydney and did an MRC clinical training fellowship that culminated in a PhD on pharmacology of anti-infective agents and since 2014 has worked in the intensive care at Withenshaw but built up a large program dealing with the sepsis and infection in the acutely unwell. And he is the natural coordinator for the COVID studies that have occurred in Manchester. So he's going to describe the global picture around what we're rapidly learning about this infection and some of the information we've garnered in Manchester from the clinical trials that have been going on. And after they've both spoken for 20 minutes, then we'll have 20 minutes for, to answer your questions. So what I'm gonna do now is switch off my microphone and camera and give the uh, forum to Rick Bodie. Rick. Thank you, Peter. Um, I hope you can see my slides, everyone. Please let me know if there's any problem with that. Um, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. So I'm going to talk, as Peter said, about our current and future approaches to diagnosis. And this relates to my own uh, interest, leading the um, Condor programme, which I'll tell you a bit about later. And that's a national programme to evaluate uh, new diagnostic tests for COVID-19. So I'm gonna start by going through a little bit of uh, background um, and recap how far we've come uh, during this pandemic. And we've come a really long way. Um, January seems like an eternity away. And here's a pipeline of how far we've come with regard to diagnostic testing. So you remember that the first case was really reported at the end of December in, uh, in China. And by January the 10th, the genome of SARS-CoV-2 had been sequenced and published online with open access. Just one week later, the first uh, RT-PCR assay to identify the virus was reported online and again published with open access. And just two weeks later, in the United States, the FDA issued emergency use authorization for the first commercial RT-PCR assay. That's an incredible timeline, isn't it? I mean, within just a few weeks of knowing about this virus, we had a commercialized um, uh, assay to detect the virus, which is amazing. And then just around six weeks after that, the first point of care test to, do that, to detect the virus received emergency use authorization by the FDA. And that, of course, would normally take us years. And again, just a couple of weeks after that, we saw the first antibody test receiving emergency use authorization by the FDA. And then in May, we could see that the website FindDx, which creates an almost like a registry of uh, CE marked diagnostic tests, told us that there were two, 247 CE marked diagnostic tests related to the diagnosis of COVID-19. So there's been an explosion of activity in the scientific community, in the life sciences industry, to try and develop new diagnostic tests for COVID-19. And we've come a huge way uh, since this pandemic first started. Testing is really crucial to planning a successful response to COVID-19. And we get some evidence to back that statement up from the Republic of Korea. So in South Korea, they, um, they were very prepared for the pandemic for a start and they were very digitally advanced. But they took an approach of, sort of test, 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 test everybody who needs a test. And they had a, a remarkably successful response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So you can see from the stats, this is a country with a population of 51 million people very geographically close to China and you, you might well be forgiven for thinking that they, they, they were due to get um, 
hit quite hard by the virus when they when it first uh, uh, went to the Republic of Korea. But in fact, they only got less than 13,000 infections across the country and less than 300 deaths that, to date. A remarkably su successful response and this testing approach uh, is, has been um, largely uh, credited with um, the success of that response. So how have we done in the UK? Well, back in February, that eternity ago, we started with our response to testing. Here is a picture of our testing pod being installed outside the emergency department at Manchester Royal Infirmary. And you might remember that we set up these testing pods outside hospital emergency departments so that people who were symptomatic could come and get tests and they were referred by the NHS 111 service. And that was similar to what they were doing in, in South Korea where they had hundreds of pods across the country. Here's a picture of two of my colleagues in the emergency department uh, doing some of that testing. Um, they were very, very well equipped with the PPE there. You can see uh, boiler suits and aprons on top as well, which uh, you don't get nowadays. <laughs> we uh, had to relax on that due to the um, demand, of course. Um, and then we, we, we got innovative. We started to uh, have drive flu testing, so patients didn't need to enter these pods. They could have tests in the car parks. You may have seen that in the news at many places across the country. Uh, but then, of course, the, the virus really took hold. And in March, uh, we changed strategy from trying to contain the virus um, and stop it from really taking hold in the country to admitting that it's taken hold. And our goal then was to flatten the curve. And that led us on to a totally different uh, type of response. So what happened to testing? Well, our capacity for tests rapidly increased. Uh, again, the life sciences industry was pivotal in this. So this is a, a picture of an automated analyzer manufactured by Roche, and there are several of them out there, I believe. Uh, closed systems that are fully automated and can run thousands of tests a day. This, uh, analyzers like this Roche analyzer can run up to 3,000 tests uh, in 24 hours, which is uh, incredible, really, and really improved our testing capacity across the country. Although it has to be said that although it, the analyzer can run 3,000 tests per day, we are a little bit limited by the availability of reagents. Uh, we then get the first rapid tests. So on the left here, these are just some examples. I'm not advocating any particular commercial brand, but the Kefeed is one that we use at Manchester Royal Infirmary. The Gene Expert is a, uh, a benchtop analyzer that's run in the lab, uh, but gives you a four hour turnaround time as opposed to the 24 hours or so that we were waiting for RT-PCR results using the, um, the fully automated uh, analyzers. Um, so four hours makes a big difference because if you've got a patient in the emergency department and you need to send them to a ward, well, um, if we don't know whether they've got COVID, but they've got symptoms that are compatible, we have to send them to a COVID area. We haven't got enough side rooms for everyone to go there. So patients were treated in open bays. And if you put patients who haven't got COVID in an open bay with patients who have got COVID, and there's clearly a big risk, not only to the patient who's going to get infected, but then to the people who they'll go on to infect as well. So getting rapid results is really important to make sure that we don't expose patients to unnecessary risk and we get those who have got COVID to the right place straight away. On the right, you can see a picture you may have seen in the news. Donald Trump uh, announced the launch of the Abbott ID Now assay, a point of care assay that could return results to detect SARS-CoV-2 within five minutes. An incredible, incredible achievement from, the, uh, from Abbott. Um, they're not marketing it in the UK, unfortunately, and, um, but there are one or two questions over the accuracy of that assay, but still a remarkable achievement to get a point of care test deployed so quickly. And those rapid tests can clearly make a difference. I'll talk some more about those. And now we see our UK testing strategy really starting to organise um, and become uh, what it is now. So we have the four pillars of the UK testing strategy where we have pillar one, for swab testing in the PHE labs and NHS hospitals for those who have a clinical need for testing. There's swab testing in the wider population in um, at pillar two, which I think is things like testing centers and so on, um, and lighthouse labs. In pillar three, we have serology testing, so looking for antibodies uh, in people who, um, who, who uh, you know, need testing. And then in pillar four, a more sort of investigational pillar, we're looking at national surveillance by uh, PHE and other partners. Um, for you know, things like uh, just for seroprevalence and research purposes. We do 100,000 tests a day and we have a capacity to 
uh, to run 200,000 tests a day by the end of May if we, if we need to. And you see, we've, we've done really well and achieved that. So by the end of May, we were actually at a capacity of around 200,000 tests, somewhere around here it was. I think we did make, make it, this must be the 1st of May, just in time. So if it should patients need them, we actually can run up to 200,000 tests per day, which is quite an achievement. So where do we go from here, having made such fantastic progress and what are the unanswered questions? Well, one question is, how can we get new commercial tests to the market as soon as possible so that patients can benefit from them? Then we need to know how accurate the tests are. So of course, we only want the, the accurate tests to make it to the market. We need to have a way of determining how accurate they really are in a robust manner. And then also we need to think about, not just about how accurate the tests are, but how should we use them best? To, to meet the needs of the population and our patients in the NHS and where should we deploy them? So um, we set out to try and answer some of those questions and I'm going to tell you in a moment about the programme that we've uh, recently launched to try and do that. But just before I do that, I'm going to just take uh, a step to, uh, back to tell you a little bit about why having these tests and getting it right is actually so important to public health strategy. So this uh, slide just um, illustrates you know how the virus is passed on and some of the important considerations around that so when a patient gets infected they have an incubation period before they get any symptoms and then after that of course they're symptomatic for a while and for a period they're infectious and that varies depending on the infection so influenza um, uh, so the first SARS infection uh, mers cov they all have different profiles um, and here is a distribution of infectiousness so it varies and that this is just an illustration really um, with SARS-CoV-2, what we know is that you start to become infectious before you become symptomatic. Um, and then you carry on being infectious for a period after you're symptomatic, and then the infectiousness goes away. And then you get your secondary case, of course. They, this, this is, the infection is passed on during this infectious period, and then that patient has an infection, incubation period, an infectious period, and a symptomatic period. Now, why is this important? Well, these intervals matter to transmission um, because um, if you're getting passing on infections early in your symptomatic period or even before you develop symptoms then you've got a real problem a real challenge it, let's say you're only infectious much after you become symptomatic well we've got a little window there to do some tests and find out the patient's got the infection and then isolate them but uh, if it's not if that's not the case we've got a real challenge with testing we've got to be very very quick to isolate these people as soon as possible uh, uh, after they develop the infection and with COVID-19 we know that there's a particular challenge because infectiousness, as reported in this paper by uh, Lau and Nature Medicine, might start around about 2.3 days before symptom onset based on the modeling. And in fact, they, they estimated based on their modeling that 44% of all transmissions of COVID-19 might well occur before patients get any symptoms. So that's a real challenge for us, isn't it? There's not a lot you can do if you're waiting for symptoms to develop. But of course, once the symptoms develop, we need to confirm that infection as soon as possible to try and limit transmission. So rapid testing and rapid results are really important. What about antibody testing? Well, um, this is a controversial area, of course, because we haven't proven that if you've got antibodies that you're necessarily immune to future infections with COVID-19. But let's say we did use antibody testing uh, to give people some community passports and say that actually if you've got antibodies you, know, you can uh, become active and you don't need to socially distance anymore. Let's say we used it in that way. Well this group here, Grey et al, it's a, bear in mind this hasn't been peer-reviewed yet, it's a, still a preprint. They modelled what might happen to um, infections and the possibility of a second wave based on the specificity of an antibody test. So assuming that the antibody test does confer, having antibodies confers some immunity. Here, you've got the different specificities of a test. So your test is 50% specific, i.e. if you, you, know, you haven't got antibodies, then your test will be negative uh, in 50% of, of the time. This is 75% of the time, so you haven't got antibodies with the test, and the test rightly says you haven't got antibodies. So that's 75%, and on the right is 98%. Um, and then you've got these different bars on the graphs where you've got the prevalence of COVID-19, so a low prevalence in the red, and a really high prevalence in the blue. And under those circumstances, we can model what might happen to infections. So if you use a test that's not very specific, so that means you're getting a lot of false positives, telling us that people have antibodies when they don't, uh, then you can see that we're gonna quickly get a big second spike of infection here, big second wave, because we're falsely reassuring people that they have antibodies and are immune. 
and they can get active. Lots of people get active and don't socially distance, but the implications for the second wave are really huge. Whereas if you have a, you have a very specific antibody test, 98% specific, then we control the infection on this basis. So again, just highlights the importance of having accurate tests. So we designed the Condor program. Um, as Peter mentioned at the start, I direct the Diagnostics and Technology Accelerator in Manchester, and we work with companies to generate evidence for new tests. When the pandemic, pandemic started, we thought we needed to do something in this space. And we collaborated with the NIHR MedTech and In Vitro Diagnostic Cooperatives, which do a similar thing to DITA. And they're based in Oxford, London, Leeds, and Newcastle. And we developed this program uh, to evaluate multiple diagnostic tests for COVID-19. And there are four work streams that we can address. We'll look at the care pathways. So what do we have right now? How are patients looked after? How do, that, how do, that, how do they flow through a system? How are we using tests to guide their care? And how might, might new tests be used to improve those care pathways? And then we're also going to develop target product profiles for the MHRA. The team's already doing that, in fact, to say, what are the requirements of a test? You know, what, what kind of specificity do we need to hit? What kind of sensitivity do we need to have? How many copies of the virus does a test need to detect before it's clinically usable? So that's one of our work streams, uh, sort of setting the parameters by which uh, we decide whether a test might be of value to the NHS. We then got an analytical validation work stream. So when you when you look at a test and find out how good it is, you've got to first of all make sure that it works in lab conditions. So, you know, can it detect 100 copies or less of the virus, for example? Or, you know, do we have to have a lot more viral load in order for it to return a positive test? That kind of thing can be looked at by our experts in the analytical validation stream. And then we've got the in-context clinical validation work stream. And within that, we've got two big multi-center prospective studies where we're going to ask patients to take part. They'll have these new tests alongside the normal tests, which are reference methods, that we won't use the new tests to guide their care, but we'll record the results and see how they compare to the reference tests. We'll also follow patients up to know what happened to them. And that using those results, we'll find out if the tests are really accurate or not. So we have two studies, one called Raptor in the community, which is based in testing centers, GP surgeries and care homes, and one called Falcon, based in the hospital, and I'm leading that one, where we look at testing in hospital environments in all sorts of different settings. And then lastly, we might have a really nice test that works really accurately, but nobody can use it because it's, uh, it takes an awful lot of specialist expertise or it's, uh, it just doesn't work in a particular environment. So led by a team at Imperial, we're going to do a human factors evaluation as well to check that the tests are indeed usable. So that's a comprehensive program that I hope will allow us to assess these tests from start to finish um, and get them ready for use in the NHS. We take referrals from the Department of Health and Social Care's advisory groups. They prioritise tests. We then look at them and then we'll feed back to the Department of Health and Social Care and to NICE with our findings. It's funded by the NHR, Asthma UK and the British Lung Foundation, and it's on the NHR Urgent Public Health Portfolio. Um, so let's talk about some specific examples of the tests we're going to use because of commercial sensitivities but let's just give you a couple of examples of the types of tests that we might want to evaluate and the considerations around testing so here we've got a simple test looks like a sort of pregnancy test really and this is called the lateral flow assay you put your sample in and then you wait a, a little while and you maybe get a bar across here if your test is positive and um, that tells you that the patient's got a covid infection um so Let's say we take a referral for a lateral flow assay. In Condor, we've got to then decide, okay, what's good about this test? So, you know, you get rapid results. It's really easy to use. Um, what's challenging about this test? Well, perhaps with this simple method, it won't be quite as sensitive. So then we think, well, okay, how do we, how do we best use that test? This is our care pathway analysis. Could it be used for um, self-testing? It's very simple. Someone could use this in their home. Uh, that, that could be easily done. They could, uh, they, could, they could do that whenever they get symptoms, for example. Um, we, could, we could use it in GP surgeries, you know, the busy GP seeing a patient but then needs to test them. This could be used while the patient uh, is seen by their GP. Or perhaps in airports, this is, I think, one that's a bit interesting to most of us in the population. We all want to go on holiday and we all want air travel to be safe and we don't want to pass, pass on infections when we, when we travel. So we might need some testing before we board planes. And this kind of, kind of test might be helpful. Uh, also for people entering the country. So that's another potential use case. Then you've got other instruments like this. So you've, this isn't a particular one looking at COVID. I'm again trying to be agnostic of different companies. Um, but a benchtop instrument that looks like this. So 
um, you, know, you, you need a bit of expertise to run it. It's probably best in an environment where there are professionals to use it. But you do get quite rapid results, perhaps in as little as an hour. Um, the only challenge there is, you know, perhaps you can only run one test at a time, and if it takes an hour, then it's relatively slow. So we think, well, where can we place that? It might be an emergency department. So your patients are going to be with you for four hours. Um, so long as the emergency department is not too busy and not seeing too many patients with COVID, one patient at a one test at a time for an hour each might not be too bad in an emergency department. If it gets busier, you might need several analyzers though. Um, in a care home, it might be very useful. So they're sending their swabs off and not getting results for several days in certain situations. And actually, if they're screening their residents, um, given that 44% of transmission might occur before symptoms, they really want results to be much quicker than 72 hours because they want to isolate patients who are positive at the earliest opportunity to control any outbreaks. So that's a really good use case for care homes. And then there's things like endoscopy units where they want to get back to work and they've got lots of patients who need endoscopies, but of course it's got to be safe. Uh, so an instrument like this could be run when your patient arrives at the endoscopy unit, screen them quickly, and then if they pass, they can go on to have the endoscopy and it's much more safe. That's an example of how we might appraise tests and place them within a pathway and determine what, <clears throat> what kind of evaluation we have to uh, take account of. Biosafety, for example, if you're taking a sample from a patient by virus on it, how are we going to make sure that the staff are safe to run that test and we're not going to spread it then? Is there a buffer that inactivates the virus, for example? Um, what about the manufacturing capacity? So we might have a brilliant test but the company might not be able to manufacture many of them. So we've got to think about that as well. Is it the capacity to actually upscale this uh, manufacturer to meet the needs of the NHS and the country? Uh, and then we've got to consider, well, what, for this particular use case identified, what is the correct target product profile? What kind of sensitivity and specificity do we need? Because we don't need a perfect test in every situation. There's no such thing as a perfect test. But in different situations, we might need a sensitive test, which means we can be very confident someone doesn't have COVID, or a specific test where we can say that actually, if we got a positive result, then we can be really confident that it is a positive result and not a false positive. And that might vary depending on the use case. So those are a few of the things that we'll be taking account of in Condor and then going ahead with our evaluations to find out how accurate they are and feeding back. We put together a draft pathway just to think about how, we're, how we can contribute to the biomarker development pathway in Greater Manchester. And this is, I think, uh, this illustrates what we've got as a landscape here. So Condor is about evaluating tests that are right before procurement. Um, but of course, there are loads of other needs too. We need to discover new biomarkers. Um, so we're using proteomics, uh, uh, all sorts of different uh, uh, targeted methods of, of biomarker discovery. And we can do that by our big uh, bi uh, biobank studies, for example, that are going across Greater Manchester and the fantastic analytical expertise. I know you heard of heard some of about some of uh, in the last webinar. Then we've got to develop and commercialize assays and we can support companies to do that. And then we need early evaluation so the companies need access to samples. Maybe a little early for Condor, but we can perhaps do product evaluations in collaboration with the NHS and also the biobank studies that are going on uh, to try and get companies early data. And then we've got the possibility of using Condor um, to evaluate assays that are closer to procurement and then following that, of course, we reach procurement decisions. So we've got, I think, a really nice pathway for biomarker development in COVID-19 across Greater Manchester and also now across the country. So I'll finish there. I'd just like to start by saying that um, testing is crucial to inform our emergence from the COVID-19 pandemic. And I hope what we've created with the Condor programme is an infrastructure and a system that will ensure that the testing strategy that we develop can be informed by the best, most rigorous possible uh, science. Thank you very much. So I think I'm going to hand directly over to uh, Tim now, uh, who's going to talk about treatment. So I've obviously been talking about diagnosis of COVID-19. And um, Tim, you're going to move nicely on to talk about how we can treat the disease. So I'm going to hand over to you at this point. Thank you very much. Mute. Right, brilliant. Thank you, Rick. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I'm going to talk about 
uh, current and future therapeutic approaches. And the, the really good news is that um, we have some current approaches to talk about, um, and I'll get to those uh, at the end. But uh, I wanted to start with a list of, uh, of therapeutic agents, and this isn't supposed to be um, all inclusive. This is just um, supposed to illustrate the point that there are a large number of different uh, drugs out there at the moment which are being considered but they largely split into two groups so those that are active against the virus and those that are active against the uh, consequences so the immune activation and uh, what I've tried to do by underlining them is by is showing you which uh, of these uh, many therapeutic agents have been in or are in clinical trials uh, in Greater Manchester so you can see that as a city, we've made uh, a significant contribution to trying to uh, understand and treat this disease. Uh, and uh, we've recruited a lot of patients uh, into a lot of studies uh, with a broad range of different molecules. This is a, a simplified diagram, but to try and illustrate where these different stages occur. So infection occurs early, um, and, uh, and the virus is detectable even before patients are symptomatic uh, and many patients then clear the virus um, but those that don't uh, will, um, there's an option to um, try and treat the virus with the antiviral agents. Those patients that don't clear the virus then start developing an, a, a, a host response which is to try and clear the virus but becomes disordered uh, and, uh, and exaggerated and they develop this hyperinflammatory response which uh, leads to respiratory failure, multi-organ failure, admission to our critical care units, and sadly, uh, uh, unfortunately, ultimately death. But there is an option then to try and intervene with um, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, agents um, later on in the disease pathway. So this is just uh, briefly to outline some of the antiviral uh, activities. So this is the virus, entering the alveolus you can see here so it sits in the airway it enters the host cell uh, and inside the host cell it unravels the rna is is ex exhaust uh, exits into the cell uh, where it um, is replicated the new virus particles are assembled and then it exits the cell again uh, and along this pathway is where we can start to intervene so hydroxychloroquine uh, it stops the virus from entering the cell. So the function that actually lets it bind to the cell surface and then enter the cell itself in the lung is inhibited by hydroxychloroquine. So hydroxychloroquine was picked up very early by lots of people, including uh, the US president. Uh, it's a drug which we are very familiar with. We use it to treat and prophylax against malaria. Uh, and it's used for a number of autoimmune conditions, including diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Uh, so it's a drug we're familiar with. The only issue with malaria, with uh, hydroxychloroquine was that the dose required to uh, have antiviral properties in treatment was quite high. And there was significant concern that we would start to see cardiac toxicity and arrhythmia. So remdesivir uh, is a, a commercial product. So this was one of the few unlicensed antivirals which came very quickly to, uh, into trials. It's owned by Gilead. Uh, it's been in the news today because of uh, all the concerns around lack of supply. Uh, and we can talk about that at, at the end, but remdesivir uh, stops the RNA from replicating. So the, the virus still gets into the cell, but it can't replicate. You can't produce more viruses and go on and spread. So remdesivir is a novel compound, it's active against lots of viruses and was initially developed by Gilead for treatment of Ebola, but they've never managed to finish their Ebola trials program, uh, but it was very quickly pivoted into COVID-19. And the last of the antivirals I'm going to tell you about is Leponavir, Etonavir. So this is an old HIV drug. Uh, our ID physicians have a lot of experience of using this drug, which is uh, not used so much uh, to treat HIV anymore. But again, it stops the viral replication uh, within the cell. So there are some examples of the antivirals. And most of the drugs work somewhere along that same pathway of stopping the virus entering or replicating within human cells. 
So the second half is then what we call cytokine storm or this hyper-inflammatory response. And those that saw Tracy and her group's excellent presentation a couple of weeks ago will, uh, will, will have seen some of this already. So this slide on the top left-hand side shows the interleukin-6, so a, a pro-inflammatory cytokine, which is very rarely seen in, in healthies. Uh, in patients with mild and moderate disease, we see uh, mild elevations of IL-6. But in those patients with severe disease, we see very high levels of interleukin-6. And what we know is that, that both interleukin-6 and other pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1, uh, when those levels are raised, it's associated with uh, a poor outcome with a greater risk of death uh, in those patients who have the highest levels of, um, of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Alongside this overexpression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, we see uh, some atypical activation of, of monocytes that Tracy was telling us about and reduced lymphocyte counts. And all this ends with uh, immune-mediated first lung and then multi-organ failure and, and, and ultimately uh, leads to death in a, in a significant number of patients who are admitted to critical care. So the idea of treating this immune dysregulation is to try and dampen down this inflammatory response. But there is a concern that if we over dampen it, we can cause immunosuppression. Uh, and that will open the door for secondary infection, particularly bacterial infection, on top of uh, a virus. There are a number of immune modulating agents, and I'm not going to go through all of them. These were two of the early ones that um, were entered into trials right at the beginning and have been used outside of trials. So tozilizumab uh, inhibits interleukin-6. Uh, it's used in hematology uh, to treat uh, cytokine release syndrome. So cytokine release syndrome is very similar to uh, the cytokine storm, but it, it uh, affects patients who have had CAR T cell therapy for uh, hematological malignancy. Um, uh, it's a, a safe drug. It's also used for a number of rheumatological diseases and we use it frequently and we were comfortable using it in the ICU as we were with Anakinra, an interleukin-1 blocker. Uh, again, there's evidence for its use in sepsis and hematological, hematological malignancy in a very similar syndrome. Again, macrophage activation, which is similar to cytokine release, similar to cytokine storm. So these are very specific targeted therapies to try and block specific limbs of the hyperinflammatory response. There are some broader uh, uh, interventions that have been used. So corticosteroids, particularly dexamethasone, has a very widespread uh, anti-inflammatory uh, effect. Convalescent plasma is probably the one drug I was asked about by families the most during uh, the middle of the pandemic. So this is where uh, blood, is taken from patients who have had COVID, which contains antibodies, and given to patients uh, who, um, who are actively infected with the virus, uh, with the idea being that you have boosted the immune system, you try and uh, limit viral replication. And there's some evidence that it has been from uh, other viruses, SARS and Ebola, uh, where um, convalescent plasma has been used in the past. And then most recently, we've started seeing stem cells coming into early phase trials uh, to try and, so stem cells have an action where they essentially try and restore homeostasis uh, and try and dampen down that inflammatory response, but hopefully have the advantage of not uh, ending up with the over dampened immunosuppressed feature. I'm gonna briefly mention about vaccines, primarily because we haven't seen any vaccine studies in Manchester, although they will be with us uh, very soon. But essentially, our vaccines allow us to develop immunity by imitating the infection. And there's lots of ways of doing that, but largely it's against this spike protein. So this is a, a picture of the virus. And this funny looking sort of green and blue thing on the cell surface is the spike protein. So that's what binds in to, um, uh, to its receptor in the human cell. It's what causes um, it's what triggers um, the, the host response. And by putting that protein either onto a, uh, an adenovirus, which is, isn't pathogenic, or a deactivated coronavirus, or just using a bit of RNA to try and get the human body to produce the spike protein, we can start generating the antigen and therefore generating uh, an immune response. It was very 
clear from the way that uh, the pandemic started rolling out across China and Europe that uh, we needed to do something to develop uh, therapeutic approaches. And looking back at previous pandemics, it was clear that the approaches we'd used hadn't worked. So if we look at SARS and MERS and then Ebola, we can see that there were very few randomized controlled trials, despite lots of drugs being used in retrospected, uncontrolled uh, cohort studies. And as a result, no treatments were identified for any of those pathogens uh, to try and uh, to treat. And the chief medical officer, supported by the UK government, uh, released a statement in March of this year saying that no antiviral medicines, and they included the anti-inflammatory drugs, were approved to treat human coronaviruses. And that investigational agents, so whichever agent you like, they were all investigational, uh, shouldn't be used outside of the context of a clinical trial. And so um, uh, the UK, all the hospitals across the UK were therefore uh, uh, asked to join a number of clinical trials looking at investigational medical products. It's worth just saying that uh, this is pretty tough. UK the trials in acute care are, are not uh, not easy. Uh, our patients were largely terrified. Most of them were pretty sick. Uh, we didn't have any families in the hospital, so all the patients were on their own. These are time critical therapies, so we can't give people the usual time to think about it. And we're trying to communicate uh, with our patients wearing full PPE. And this is a picture of me in the middle of an ICU wearing full PPE and you can imagine how difficult it is to explain trials wearing that gear. So this is uh, recovery. Uh, so this was the fourth iteration of the recovery protocol and the, probably the most complicated, but it shows you an idea of how the trial was constructed and the UK very quickly went to using platform studies. So these large platforms where we could try multiple agents for a broad range of patients and it could adapt over time. So if a drug was shown to be ineffective, it, it could drop out and new treatments could drop in. And so a patient enters the recovery trial, they're consented on the ward uh, and they're randomized to one of these arms. So if I go through them, SOC, standard of care, then uh, so this is Kaletra, the HIV drug, Lebonavir, Ritonavir, Dexamethasone, Hydroxychloroquine and Azithromycin. And then you could either be given convalescent plasma or not convalescent plasma. And then you enter the second randomization step where you're given tozilizumab or not. So 20 different therapeutic options from one trial. So how are these drugs faring? So tozilizumab we don't know from recovery yet, but it has been reported out in some trials from uh, Europe, the Italians were very keen on tozilizumab and reported out very promising results. So in their retrospective reviews, they showed that tozilizumab reduced mortality, reduced the requirement for mechanical ventilation. But they did comment that prospective validation was required and therefore trials like recovery are still critically important. Similar story for Anna Kinra, retrospective cohorts with historic controls, but showing promising results. So reducing risk of death, reducing the requirements for mechanical ventilation in the ICU. And really important that these drugs were safe. So that concern that we had, that we dampened the immune system didn't seem to be occurring. We weren't seeing lots of super added infections in patients who were treated with these drugs. And both these drugs, anakimra and tocilizumab, are in prospective randomized controlled trials. We've also learned that a number of treatments are ineffective. So hydroxychloroquine and laponavir, ritonavir have both dropped out of recovery now because they were shown to be of no benefit. So a, a huge number of patients have been randomized. So 1,500 uh, to both hydroxychloroquine and laponavir, over 3,000 into their standard care arms, and neither shown to improve mortality. So those drugs have dropped out of many studies now and are um, dropping out of uh, use across the world. So this is a trial which is changing practice globally. So remdesivir, uh, so this data comes from the, uh, from the US and FDA, uh, approved drug now, just granted marketing authorization in the UK. So 1,000 patients given remdesivir, and it showed a reduction in the time to recovery. So four days less illness. 
Uh, and although they reported out the same mortality, a slightly better mortality with remdesivir, but not statistically different. And importantly, a safe drug, so no adverse events seen. And so this drug is available in the UK, uh, and I'll tell you at the end a little bit about how we're prescribing it in Manchester. So this is a cautionary tale. So corticosteroids, and we've seen a lot of retrospective work. Um, and uh, in um, April of this year, a meta-analysis came out showing that uh, 15 trials have been done of corticosteroids, all retrospective, all in China, and all showed a higher risk of death a higher risk of length of stay and more adverse events associated with corticosteroids. And as a result, we had problems getting patients into trials that had steroids. They were reluctant to consent. Clinicians were reluctant to put patients into trials, but luckily uh, those trials uh, carried on. We were able to move forward. There were other trials coming out, which uh, suggested that they might be safe. Uh, and we ended up with the results that were announced last week of dexamethasone. So 2,000 patients recruit, uh, given dexamethasone, over 4,000 patients given standard care, and a significant improvement in mortality. So of our patients in the ICU, for every eight we ventilate, we would prevent one death if we treated those eight with dexamethasone. And of the patients on the ward, so of every 25 patients on the ward requiring oxygen, one death would be prevented if we gave them all dexamethasone. So this is where we are now. And this diagram on the, on the right-hand side, the flow diagram. So this is um, the Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust treatment algorithm for COVID-19. So this was approved on Thursday of last week and is now standard care. And what you'll see within it is it's got both dexamethasone and remdesivir. And this is incredible. I think we, um, to go from the first reported case of uh, a virus, a novel virus at the end of December of 2019 to the WHO declaring a pandemic in March and then two trials opening uh, at the end of that month in March. And then three months later, we're incorporating evidence-based medicines uh, into a treatment algorithm that have been shown to improve um, important endpoints, including mortality. So just to summarize, where are we now? So we've lost hydroxychloroquine and leponavir, ritonavir. They're no longer considered uh, a, an option for hospitalized patients. There may be some role for hydroxychloroquine in prophylaxis, but those studies are ongoing. We've got two drugs now which are standard care and all our patients are getting them. In fact, we've got patients in the hospitals at the moment who are on that dual combination therapy. We haven't found the immune modulation uh, therapies yet. Those trials are still ongoing, but the early results, as I said, are, are promising. But things are getting a bit more complicated for those studies now because standard of care has changed. And it's unclear how immune modulation will work, particularly with dexamethasone. And as I said, uh, the vaccine trials are now underway or about to become underway. Uh, so I just wanted to finish um, just thank everyone, uh, patients, the research teams, our clinical teams, admin, everyone across uh, the trust, the NHS uh, and the university. Um, you know, we have recruited over th about 3,000 participants into studies uh, and it's been a, a colossal team effort. So, um Tim, Rick, that, that was tremendous. That we've, One of the technical problems with Zoom is we can't have a round of applause for you. So you can just have sort of a quiet virtual round of applause. That was excellent. We've, we are inundated with questions, one of which is, can we give you another seminar because there's so much more people want to learn? Uh, hopefully, Tim, Rick, you can see the questions that are, that are coming up. And maybe we can start by... Rick, some of the questions have been around the use of saliva and the, the risks and the utility of saliva in diagnosis before we come to some therapeutic questions. Yes, that's a great question because um, having a nose and throat swab is very uncomfortable for patients and um, of course it requires a level of skill. So I've talked about a use case for self-testing where you couldn't really do your own nose and throat swab. Um, 
So saliva testing offers a really convenient means of collecting samples and it's uh, been proposed that, uh, as I suggested, that COVID uh, affects your salivary glands first. So it's a good medium to test for COVID in. Um, and there's loads of interest in this. So I think there's a, uh, there's a reply from Emily in the uh, chat just talking about the uh, Innovation Observatory from the NIHR and the great work that they're doing on this. And indeed, all uh, the first three referrals that we've taken in a Falcon study to evaluate new tests for in, in a hospital environment have all been using saliva as a medium. Um, so it seems that that's the really, really topical one. And I think that's going to be uh, the future testing, you know, a very important medium for testing. I mean, we should always bear in mind that when you're sampling somebody for, for COVID or any infectious disease, um, don't take the absence of the virus in one medium as evidence that there's no virus anywhere. You know, we know that from nose and throat swabs. Sometimes if you've got a low respiratory tract infection, you need to sample the sputum and it won't be there in the nasopharyngeal aspirate. Um, sometimes it'll be in a feces and nowhere else. Um, so, you know, it's not going to be uh, the, uh, um, you can't take it that, that saliva is going to replace everything. There's no need for something anything else, but it certainly will be a very, very convenient and useful method if we can validate accuracy of the methods. And, and isn't there also the, one of the hesitations around saliva, why it's been slightly slow to come to the table, is because it's so infectious and actually it's the handling of the samples, the uh, delivery of samples that carries a risk to all the staff that, that handle them. And, and that's one of the crucial issues in commercialising, upscaling saliva or not. Yeah, absolutely. And that um, speaks to the point I made about biosafety. So when we started the Condor programme, we hadn't actually realised how important this issue of biosafety would be, but it's huge. I don't think the companies uh, generally recognised that it was so important either because the, only a minority had considered it. But it is really important to think about, well, OK, this is a highly infectious uh, sample with live virus in it. How are we going to make sure that it isn't actually a means of transmitting the virus? And some of the tests that you might see involve steps such as um, uh, mixing the sample in an open test tube and you know there's potential for aerosolization there which is particularly important so there's a big work stream at public health england and porting down looking at methods of violent activation so any companies that are working in this space and developing tests i'd uh, definitely recommend that they consider introducing a violent activation step getting a buffer that inactivates the virus and proving that it works with Public Health England and uh, Neil Woodford and his group at Public Health England, um, because that, that will, that's going to be huge uh, to get tested to market. It's going to be really important. Good. Should we jump around a bit? Tim, I don't know what you want to pick up on, but there's obviously quite a lot of questions about the dexamethasone in use of dexamethasone. Do you want to, we've got objective data, do you want to speculate how that can be optimised in the sense of the timing of introduction of dexamethasone? Because clearly, just so that we know it works better, I know the Daily Mail headline was that it was going to conquer COVID, um, and, and you tell us it saves one death and eight in intensive care, which is significant, but it's not conquering. Could we better use, what's the optimum timing? What, what, how are we going to develop what we've learned from steroids? So, so I think, um, I mean, that's a really difficult question to answer because uh, of the way the trial was designed. So um, uh, the recovery trial was designed to be run in a, in a very hostile environment. It was designed by a team who do Ebola studies and um, it's very pragmatic. So trying to deep dive into the study to work out exactly which cohort of patients it is that benefit is going to be really difficult. And I totally agree. You know, there are surely patients who, um, who steroids don't do anything, have any benefit for, and those that are, uh, that get the most benefit. And I don't know how we're going to unpick that. Um, one of the problems with recovery is that patients can go into the study at any point in their disease. So, um, they're, in, they're not included necessarily at hospital admission. They could even be put in once they're in the ICU. Um, so uh, I think we're going to end up having to do some more observational work now that it's standard of care to look at how uh, immune phenotype changes 
uh, when these drugs are being given to try and work out exactly which patients we benefit from. I mean, steroids, are, there's a lot of questions about steroids uh, and patients that are shielding as well. And it's very clear that steroids work very differently when they're given in the acute setting compared to when they're given uh, chronically in patients who are uh, essentially well but on maintenance treatment at home. Uh, and I think the risks in terms of um, uh, superadded infections are, are very different uh, in those different cohorts. Um, and I'm not sure we understand exactly why that is, but I agree with you, the timing is critical. Uh, and, and for those that haven't done clinical trials, it is an astonishment testament how quickly when the world puts its mind to it that they can set up sophisticated studies get around the issues of consent, where often one could spend a year or two trying to get some of these drugs into clinical trials that we have got, not only not the studies done, the answer is published and acting on the, on the results within three months of, of COVID really hitting intensive care. So it is an astonishing testament. You alluded to remdesivir and the supply issues and where it comes in. Uh, what can you say about the availability of it in in Manchester? So uh, all the hospitals were given stock before uh, about three weeks ago when the MHRA uh, uh, um, opened their early access scheme, so before the li drug was licensed. Uh, so everywhere in Manchester is carrying drug stock. Uh, Gilead have also released all the uh, trial, unused trial drug back into the NHS. So uh, we, both North Manchester and MFT, were running uh, trials with remdesivir, which closed because they got to their target recruitment, and that trial drug is, is still in Manchester. So uh, the pharmacies have uh, quite a lot of stock at the moment. I think the question is going to be how, how good their manufacturing is, um, whether they can uh, pick up an, a pace enough to to restock us once we've run out. Because it is impressive that it seems to be safe to give, so that that must expand the, when you start to give it, potentially one could be giving it earlier if it's so well tolerated. Uh, so it's an intravenous drug, which is a, a downside, although Gilead have a nebulized version in, um, uh, in trial at the moment. Um, so the IV limits it to really only hospitalised patients. Yes. I mean, we've been very strict about applying the rule, the, the inclusion criteria for the study. And it was given early within the first four days of admission to those patients. Uh, and so it seemed that that was the right way to go. And we shouldn't be treating patients who are a long way into their hospitalisation with it. But were we admitting patients to hospital too late? In the UK? Uh, so, I'd, so the... I mean, we don't know the answer to that because we didn't include those patients in a trial. Uh, but you know, you know the, if we've learned anything from sepsis and bacterial infection and antibiotics, early treatment of infection is, is better. So I would agree. I think the earlier you get the antivirals in, the, the better. I, I'm not necessarily telling you. I'm just encouraging the discussion. Now, it's, it's, we're virtually time up, I, I, and I'm trying to capture everybody's questions, and I don't know whether... Tim or Rick, if there's any particular questions you want to address. Um, there, there was, I mean, I wanted to pick up a general question for you, Rick, which was about understanding the utility of tests. It is incredibly impressive what the Koreans did by testing in large numbers. And you made one comment which I might take exception to. I think you said, there's not a lot you can do before symptoms develop in terms of, of and you were referring to the testing, but of course, what we, and, and, and thinking, you mentioned endoscopy and testing people at the bedside before endoscopy. And the decision we've made in Manchester is not to test people before endoscopy. And, 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 the, and you can respond to this. And, and the, the thinking process is currently, I think it's about one person in 1700 has COVID in the UK, that's the prevalence. And if you're asymptomatic when you attend for endoscopy, then there's, a, you know, the, what does the data say? That in the first 24 hours after infection, your swab will be negative. 
and there's still a good possibility it's negative four days after infection. So if you're in that pre-infection status and your chance pre-test probability is one in 750, you're only going to reduce that to one in 2,000, one in 3,000 by a negative test. It's a, it's a fairly modest impact. And, and, and that actually testing is very important, but actually the biosecurity and what you can be doing when you're asymptomatic, when you don't know you've got it, is potentially be wearing that controversial face mask. And do you want to just respond to some of those comments, Rick? Yeah, really important points, Peter. I think that uh, highlights though why, why it's so important to understand the accuracy of the tests that we're using. Because once we understand the accuracy, we can make reasoned arguments like that. Uh, the challenge that we've got is we don't necessarily understand the accuracy of the tests very well at the moment. And the, the, the data that we do have is generally from small cohorts uh, in case control situations, uh, which is not a good way to assess the diagnostic accuracy of a case uh, of a test. You know, if you, for example, select 30 cases and 100 controls, well, the controls you select may, you know, one approach has been to select them from pre-pandemic uh, times, and this, the samples might be older, they might be, you know, it's not, not the same as testing fresher samples, and the cases that you identify might be the ones with more severe disease, because that you, you want to get the obvious cases, and it gives you a false impression of diagnostic accuracy. So a lot of the data that we're basing our uh, modelling and assumptions on are actually, you know, not, not particularly robust. So that's why I think we need uh, Condor um, to provide us robust in context validation of the tests. And then once we have those data, we can do the modelling, just like you've suggested, to understand, okay, well, what happens when we apply that? in a population with a certain prevalence? What are the implications of making a certain decision based on the test? Um, and that's a very reasoned argument that you made, Peter, that you know, there may be cases where actually doing no test uh, is the best solution because you shift the probabilities very little either way with a positive or negative result. That's another point I should make, as long as you're there for if you're the operator who's doing the endoscopist has your full appropriate PPE. So in a sense, you're treating everybody as positive because you know that the test doesn't necessarily guarantee you it, um, the certainty that they're negative. So, uh, our time is up. Um, I think what you've described is a testament to how fast modern science can move, how joined up Manchester is, because you both work for One Trust in, in different hospitals, but the studies described have involved the university, university laboratories, multiple hospitals in, in Greater Manchester. How many hospitals have participated in the trials, Tim, in recovery in Greater Manchester? I think they all have. Yeah. And, and, and to be able to do that and join it all up, and the idea that you're collecting samples and recruiting patients 24-7 is an amazing testament to how the system can work when it's called upon. So I'm very grateful to the pair of you for sharing. People have already asked that we get you back sometime. And I hope it won't be necessary. And I gather, Tim, that you're having trouble now recruiting to some of your studies because the, the flow of patients has thankfully slowed. Um, and all of that is good news. But maybe we'll have to get you back one day. Thank you very much. There were some technical problems with the audio and with the, the video. And that therefore it will all be available on the YouTube channel for people that want to watch it, hopefully in slightly better quality. Thank you all very much. And I'll end the meeting there. Thank you.